Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, we've heard a lot about Cambridge Analytica this week, but you haven't heard it all yet. And trust me, you will want to keep watching this. In an exclusive investigation, the Sunday Politics can reveal how SCL Elections, the company which then went on to become Cambridge Analytica, boasted of cynical and undemocratic interference in foreign elections. The company went on to be awarded at least six contracts with the British government, and Ellie Price has been doing the digging. The story this week has seemed fiendishly complicated, and it is, but it's something we should probably all be slightly worried about. The Sunday Politics has been leaked this document from the parent company of Cambridge Analytica. We'll come back to that in a moment. But what I think this all boils down to is who's using our data and for what? The story starts with 270,000 people taking a personality test on Facebook in 2014. The sort of slightly silly thing you might do when you've got a spare two or three minutes. This isn't it, by the way, but one like it. In the 2014 case, by taking part, it meant developers of the app could get hold of not only the user data of the person doing the quiz, but also the data of their friends on Facebook. In fact, about 50 million users, mainly in the States, were probably affected. The claim is that data was sold to Cambridge Analytica, which then used it to psychologically profile people and deliver pro-Trump material to them in the US election. Cambridge Analytica, who did work for the Trump campaign, deny that. But it hasn't helped that Cambridge Analytica's now suspended chief executive, Alexander Nix, was caught on camera by Channel 4, with an undercover reporter posed as a businessman wanting to influence a local election. Mr Nix appeared to talk about how his firm could discredit political rivals. The man sitting next to him is Mark Turnbull. Well, I'm a master of disguise. Yes. <laughs> the managing director of a company called SCL Elections, what became Cambridge Analytica. And SCL had at least six contracts with the British government. This is where it gets even more interesting. We've been handed this brochure published by SCL a few years ago setting out what it can do for its clients. It talks about being able to win elections, of using military applications adapted for civilians, of exploiting the fears and worries of voters, and even of persuading people not to vote. The document no longer exists on the website, but details work carried out in various foreign elections. In Latvia in 2006, SCL said its research showed ethnic tensions between the indigenous Latvian and Russian populations would play a determinative role in voting. The company claimed it ensured this crucial wedge issue was used by its client. In Nigeria in 2007, SCL claimed it organised anti-election rallies on polling day in opposition strongholds, even using local religious figures to maximise their appeal to rural communities. And before the elections in Trinidad and Tobago in 2010, SCL describes an ambitious campaign of political graffiti that ostensibly came from the youth, so the client party could claim credit for listening to a united youth. Most of the examples detailed in the brochure happened before the MOD, the Home Office and the Foreign Office entered into contracts with SCL. It also makes bold claims about close links to the British government. It says SCL received List X accreditation from the MOD, which provided government-endorsed clearance to handle information protectively marked as confidential and above. It then says inquiries can be directed through any British High Commission or Embassy. Well, I'm in Westminster now and I'm going to go meet Lord Hayne, the former Labour Foreign Minister. He's seen the document and isn't happy. This company is claiming official endorsement from British em embassies and high commissions around the world for campaigns that no British government should attach its name to, spreading racism in Latvia, sp spreading fake youth graffiti in Trinidad and Tobago, actually seeking to su suppress voter turnout in Nigeria. This is contrary to all official government policy of encouraging free and fair elections from Russia to Zimbabwe. 
Do you think there will be other companies doing similar things that we don't even know about yet? I think we're just lifting the lid on a potential horror story of using social media from, from Facebook to other platforms in order really to manipulate voters on a vast scale. Well, Lord Haynes just told me that he's going to go and table a written question now in the Lords asking the British government to disassociate itself from any of the claims made in this paper. The Foreign Office told us it is not now nor ever has been the case that inquiries for SCL can be directed through any British High Commission or Embassy. They also added that our understanding is that at the time of signing the SCL contract, the Foreign Office was not aware of SCL's reported activity in Latvia or Nigeria. On the security clearance, the MOD says SCL only held a provisional List X accreditation and haven't had it since 2013. Well, the number keeps ringing out. I have been trying to ring SCL all day for some kind of response. As yet, nothing. This is their head office, but yeah, still haven't heard from them. The registered address on SCL's website is the same as Cambridge Analytica's. Eventually, the acting CEO of Cambridge Analytica sent us a statement saying, Cambridge Analytica was formed in 2013 out of a much older company called SCL Elections. We take the disturbing recent allegations of unethical practices in our non-US political business very seriously. The board has launched a full and independent investigation into SCL elections past practices and its findings will be made available in due course. The offices here were raided on behalf of the Information Commissioner on Friday night. The company appears to have a growing list of questions to answer. Well, let's discuss all this with the former International Development Secretary, Andrew Mitchell, who's in the Midlands. Thank you for joining us this morning. You must be deeply concerned by what you heard just there. Yes, I think it's uh, absolutely appalling. And, of course, the specific uh, three examples which you mentioned, that in Latvia, stirring up racial hatred, and also in, the, in uh, the Caribbean and in Nigeria, and of course in Kenya, where they've been active, where of course uh, the last election was very heavily contested. There was a great deal of violence, and the previous election, uh, there was massive violence, and it became a, a very concerning and deep international issue. So the, the document lays out a whole series of exceedingly undesirable and pretty corrupt uh, practices, and of course, these practices run entirely counter to the work that the British taxpayer is funding to try and get free and fair elections, putting taxpayers' money into trying to make sure there is a transparent and open procedure in these elections. So it's very concerning that a, a company like SCL is behaving in this way and is subverting the work that the British government is doing in many parts of the world very successfully. Very concerning that they're behaving that way. But also very concerning, is it not, that the British government has contracts with a company who's not only been doing this, but boasting about doing this? Well, it's not clear from what the Foreign Office told you whether that is still the case, but I have no doubt that any... Well, it doesn't really matter uh, whether British, they've got ongoing uh, contracts or not. Any contract be shouldn't have been undertaken with this company, should they? Well, I, it's perfectly clear from this document that the very unsavoury activities which, in which they are engaging run totally counter to the policy of the British government in promoting free and fair elections in the developing world. So should the government be undertaking an investigation into how on earth it was that they were offering contracts, paying money to a company who in other parts of the world were subverting the very aims of that same government? Well, it's clear that uh, Peter Hayne is tabling a question to the government and no doubt the government will then come and explain to what extent they're still involved in this company and why uh, in the past they have been involved. But uh, in, in this area and in all other areas of associated activity, which you mentioned on your programme earlier, the, the key issue is that we should have transparency and total openness and accountability so that we can see what is being done in our name. Because this document that we were looking at, I mean, it's not available anymore, but it, they were, it, was, it was publicity material that was being distributed in 2013. And yet after that, 
2014-15, as late as 2017, the MOD and the Foreign Office are contracting this company to do work. Now, they may say they didn't know about it, but surely if the company is producing publicity material, boasting of what they've been doing, this is not a company that the British government should be contracting with. Well, it depends what uh, purposes they were contracted for. Does it? And what specific services they carried out for the government. But in respect of the revelations which you have made about this document, which I have read, it's perfectly clear that the British government should have nothing to do with a company that is behaving in this way. Why would the British government want to contract with a company like this anyway? I mean, apparently they were undertaking targeted audience analysis uh, on behalf of the government. For instance, with the MOD, they wanted them to analyse how people would interact with certain government messaging. Now, one can understand why a political party might want to do that, but why does government want to do that? Well, I, I'm not privy to the details of the contract which the government awarded, and we would need to know what those details were in order to reach a conclusion on the perfectly valid question you are asking. But in respect of the document which you have produced today, which I have, have read, and in respect of the activities that they've been undertaking in the developing world, which are the activities you've asked me to comment on, uh, I, I think these activities are deeply unsavoury and they run totally counter to the policies and practices which are funded by the British taxpayer, which are taking place in the developing world. And the government obviously had looked into them, uh, well, well, one would hope, um, fairly deeply because they gave them List X clearance and that allows them access to information which is secret or above. So before you start handing out secret documents to people, one would imagine that you would undertake a fair amount of back ground research into them and would have uncovered at the very least some of their publicity material. Well, it was confidential and, and, and above and these are snake oil salesmen but you will want to ask the British government to answer those questions because they are the people who are in, who are in possession of that information. But you were the International Development Secretary at a time when this company was claiming it could be contacted through British embassies and high consulates around the world. Well, their, their, their documentation and their activities never came uh, into my office. And as far as I'm aware, I had no contact or any dealings with them at all. I mean, it, it was the policy of the Department for International Development when you were there uh, to strengthen the democratic character of the Nigerian political processes uh, by providing support to key electoral bodies and so on. That's what the, the, the Diffus website claimed. That was presumably what you yourself were working towards. Did you have any idea that previous to that there had been a company, whether or not you knew about their British government links, who had been working to do the precise opposite in Nigeria? No, and of course the excellent work that was carried out by DFID in promoting free and fair elections where uh, we put British taxpayers' money into that is entirely different from the activities of SEL, which of course were paid for by political elements within those countries to handle elections in the very unsatisfactory and repugnant way in which your report sets out. Uh, and so, I mean, you, you, you pointed to the fact that Peter Hayne is tabling a question and, and doubtless some kind of investigation into this will need to be undertaken. Uh, you've been inside government. You know how this works. When contracts like this are handed out, who is it who's signing them off and who is it that we need to ask some serious questions of as to why the British government wanted to do business with SCL elections? Well, the British government is one entity and, and therefore you will get one answer from the government uh, to the questions that you ask and that Peter Hayne tables in the, in the House of Lords. You know, the government acts as one entity and, and, and that's, you'll get the answer, the official answer and the accurate answer from the government in the normal way. Well, the normal way isn't always to give us all of the answers that we're looking for on questions like this. Well, that's, that's why we have in this country a, an, a, a rumbustious and effective probing media to make sure that the establishment and the state can't hide behind obfuscation. And I have no doubt whatsoever that the media will extract the full details of this, as they have on other issues recently, um, once the questions have been asked. Will you be asking some questions of your own? Because there you were, as the International Secretary for International Development, doing your best to foster democracy around the world. And now you discover that the MOD and the FCO at the same time were handing out contracts to SCL elections. You must want some answers to that yourself. 
Well, I, th I think it's, 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 it's pretty clear that DFID was not uh, engaged uh, in, in this. But Absolutely. I shall certainly look with great interest at the question which Peter Hain uh, asks and the answer which he receives from the government. Andrew Mitchell, thank you very much for joining us this morning. And now let's return to our top story, the revelations that SCL Elections, the company which then went on to become Cambridge Analytica, boasted of its links to the British government after it had publicly disclosed its interference in elections around the world. A short while ago I asked the former International Development Secretary Andrew Mitchell if the British government should really have continued contracting with SCL. Well, it depends what uh, purposes they were contracted for Does it? and what specific services they carried out for the government. But in respect of the revelations which you have made about this document, which I have read, it's perfectly clear that the British government should have nothing to do with a company that is behaving in this way. Um, so we have this document that he was talking about, the one that was passed to the Sunday politics here, in which uh, this company, SCL Elections, boasts of their uh, interference in elections around the world, I mean, in complete contravention of what Andrew Mitchell's department were wanting to do in terms of bolstering democracy there. Um, he seems fairly appalled and wants some answers. Is this going to be something that will trouble the government? Yeah, I think it will, uh, and hugely, because we also learned today elsewhere that these contracts that the, the FC and MED have with SEL elections, one of them only expired last month. So this is not some ancient historical problem. Uh, and I think this plays into the, the far bigger question, which is there are companies like SEL, Cambridge Analytica, AIQ, going around exploiting this huge area called data, which is massively unregulated all over the world. And look at the problem Facebook has got in the United States. And these companies are coming in, whether they did it or not, to influence the EU referendum campaigns, another argument altogether. But the whole area of data, uh, there are, it's the wild west of politics at the moment. There are no laws. It's anarchy. And companies like this come and exploit. And it should be no surprise that the government should allow this completely unregulated free-for-all, that they're going to get their own fingers burned by association. We don't know exactly what SCL were doing with these government yeah, contracts, yeah. Uh, and that's something that would be very interesting to find out. Is that what matters more, or the fact that they were giving a contract at all to a company that boasts of the way it uh, it could interfere in other countries' elections? It's very, it's a very strange business, right? Their their own publicity material is a story about manipulating in a nefarious way elections across the world, and. It's impossible to conceive the situation in which the MOD, for example, needs those services. I can't see why, wh how they could help. Um, obviously, as Tom said, you know, A, it's uncharted, B, it is anarchy, C, political influence by, the, by kind of a company is, it, it only becomes controversial once it's successful, you know. So, in a way, they're kind of, the, the, They've done these things which are unethical, you know, exploiting religious and ethnic differences is kind of unethical and it's not what mm -hmm. a British Council would ever want to do. Um, but it's, hard, it's very hard to pin down which bit of it is illegal at the moment. And Peter Hayne, uh, in the clip in the film we saw earlier, was saying he thinks that this is just lifting the lid on a whole mm. lot of activity. There's no reason to assume that SCL, Elections Cambridge Analytica, are the only people who've been using uh, data in ways perhaps it wasn't intended for or doing any of this kind of thing. Because as we know, there are global political consultants all over the place. Is this just the beginning of a very big story about how our data is used, do you It think? sounds a bit like the tip of the iceberg. And I think genuinely, where people are looking at the story and not necessarily getting their head around exactly where the illegal wrongdoing is and that line between, as Zoe said, you know, the ethical and the illegal. There's a general more macro point here about people thinking, how is my information being used? How is it being exploited? We did have this back in the 90s with concerns about, say, stuff like intrusion by CCTV. Mm -hmm. And that's now gone on to the digital world. And while people accept that they do probably invade their own privacy somewhat with what they post online, I don't think they're quite aware of the extent to which their own information is then used against them by people not admitting that they're doing it. But then maybe when we start seeing things popping up on any of our social media feeds, which, of course, have been carefully targeted to appear to our likes or our fears, we'll understand that that the same way you know when a leaflet's posted through your door that it's come from a political party or right, a campaign, we'll, we'll get us, this a bit better. It will well, just we need make us more literate about 
kind of I'm, I'm annoyed I never get political adverts on Facebook they well, just obviously have me well, they, I think they, they, they wish where you're voting <laughs> well there's a consumer <laughs> argument what, what, if you buy something it'll come back at you you know yeah. I'm trying I'm looking at yeah. for a car at the moment and all I've had all week is these SUVs firing yeah. back at me we expect an element of that it's the lack of transparency about That's, the use and of I think the this data. is where this goes if you're going to get smashed by 29 different adverts a day on, on your Facebook or your Twitter profiles to vote this way vote that way you need to know that all this information is coming to you is because it's from a political party. You get a leaflet through the, yeah, your, yeah, your okay. letterbox, it says this is printed by the Conservative Party or the Labour mm. Party. That doesn't exist on social media, it doesn't exist in yes. digital, and that's what that's will But That's, that's where possibly some new rules will have to come in. Well, thank you all very much for coming thank in you. this morning. Now then, Caroline Lucas remains the Green Party's only MP, but she's been making waves over Brexit, picking up on those Cambridge analytic allegations we were talking about to call into question the outcome of the referendum itself. Welcome, Caroline Thank Lucas. Thank you very much. And so I suppose my first question must be, what is your hard evidence that there is a connection between the Cambridge Analytica and Facebook story on the one hand and the Brexit campaign on the other? Well, let me say first of all that I think that what these revelations demonstrate is that there is something rotten at the heart of our democracy and that we need to be overhauling our rules that govern elections, election funding. Is there really something rotten at the heart <clears> of our <throat> democracy? Because I still struggle to see. I mean, I can see that... Uh, data was harvested by you know from naive people who didn't understand what Facebook was doing and some of it was used by a company claiming to be brilliant mainly in America and not in here I can't really see the absolutely clear connection with the brexit campaign well, the links with Vote Leave, I think, are, are, are reasonably clear in terms of, of, of the allegations that have been made. And yes, for sure, we need to it's have just, more of an investigation, and that's what I'm calling for. What I, I want to see I is would, a real investigation into exactly who knew what. You know, the ministers associated so, with the Vote Leave campaign, what did they know about the money that was going to Believe? Um, what was the relationship between Vote Leave and Believe? And mm, then in turn, yes. what was the relationship between Believe and, of course, an aggregate IQ based in Canada? Now, this is a, a really so, complex network but it, big big questions need to be asked and it goes much wider than okay. just the referendum I, I mean I feel as an observer of this I don't know who to believe everybody is calling everybody else a liar or a charlatan or worse and I assume you're in the same situation neither of us really know what Absolutely. happened so we need an inquiry, so we need an inquiry. but we can't at this stage jump jump ahead and say therefore that the referendum was illegitimate can we? I, I, I'm not saying that actually what I what I am saying is that I think that well, it calls in, into question uh, the, the, the legitimacy the of the EU I mean your own press release says this scandal calls into question the legitimacy of the EU referendum I think, it, I think it adds further questions as to how that referendum was, was run. What I want to do is not rerun that referendum. What I want to do is to add weight to the argument that we should have a, a people's vote on the final deal. I think this is just simply so one more piece of argument because I've long argued You're not argued saying at this point that this referendum was improperly handled or that, it, or that the outcome was in any sense dubious or dodgy. I'm saying that there are questions to be answered, and I think, as you've just mm. admitted, neither of us actually know the full, sure. the full who should, picture. Who should conduct the inquiry, then? Because the Electoral Commission are conducting inquiries of their own at well, the moment. Well, I think what this whole, um, this whole saga demonstrates, really, is that the Electoral Commission simply doesn't have the resource, it doesn't have the power. It's been looking at this for mm. over a year, and nothing's happened. When it comes to data regulation, and that's uh, in the hands of the Information mm. Commissioner, her powers are so feeble that she had to wait for a week to get her people inside the offices mm. of Cambridge Analytica, by which time, presumably, they will have pressed a few delete buttons. So the whole system, that's why I come back to my original point, which is that the whole system needs to be overhauled. We've basically okay. got a set of analogue rules trying to deal with the digital age. That's not working. And in this digital age, can we at least agree that we are both surrounded by a thicket of question marks and that therefore the Green Party press release saying that this calls into question the legitimacy of the referendum is wrong? I think calls into question is an entirely fair description of that it calls into question we need to answer question those mark. questions yes another question mark can i ask about this, the second referendum question therefore which you raised it yourself is, it is can i really challenge you on that it is not a second referendum it is a first vote on the final deal the well, vote that was had in 2016 now this is a really important distinction because people will make it sound as if what we're trying to do well, one is rerun that was the first one and then there's another one and that's the second one the first one was about whether or not we will depart from the EU. It was not yeah. about the destination. No, sure. What we want is the opportunity for the people to look at the fine print when they see that's final deal because so, there has been so much that has happened between the referendum of 2016 and where we are now in 2018. So many things were promised and have not come to pass. The 350 million no, I, I for the I NHS I understand and so on. all of that. I'm 
uh, in tactical terms, practical terms, you need a large number of MPs to vote for that proposition in the House of Commons. Were you not therefore pretty disillusioned or depressed when you saw that Jeremy Corbyn sacked Owen Smith, his, his Northern Ireland spokesman, for speaking out in favour of what I'm still going to call another referendum or a second referendum or referendum, a people's poll, hashtag Andrew. two. People's poll is the, is the <laughs> phrase. Um, I, I, I was disappointed. I think that Brexit is something that goes wider and bigger than party politics. This is absolutely about the future of our country. And frankly, when there are so many deep, deep, deep concerns about the way in which Brexit is going, not just the economic concerns, where every single impact assessment the government has done shows us being worse off. It is quite extraordinary to see a government proudly leading us down a road that they admit is going to make us poorer. Mm. Add into that uh, concerns about the NHS, the fact that the number of nurses coming into the NHS is down by 90%. Add into that, even more serious in my view, is the situation in Ireland. This ideological obsession with leaving the customs union and what that might mean in terms of a hard border in Ireland. So I wish the Labour Party had gone further. I'm glad they've got as far as saying, yes, we should remain in A or the it customs union. It seems to be union. this far and no further, though, doesn't it? It does. And, and that, I think, is an absolute... Uh, mm. it, it, it's letting down young people in particular. It is a dereliction of, of their responsibility as an of, official opposition. They have the opportunity here to save this country from a massive impoverishment, and they are not and, doing and it. And yet, when you look at the Corbynite Labour Party on the one hand and the Green Party on the other, it's clear that somebody is doing something right, and it's not you guys. Your membership has plunged since 2015 when Jeremy Corbyn became Labour leader, and the number of people voting for you has more than halved. And that coincides with Corbyn's takeover of the Labour Party. So it appears that a lot of the kind of more radical, environmentally minded people who were attracted to the Green Party are turning instead to the Labour Party. Well, look, we have a, a, a rotten electoral system. You won't be surprised to hear me say that. In 2015, we had a million people voting Green. And if we'd had a proportional electoral system, that yeah. could have delivered us about 20 MPs. Of course, it's yeah. no secret that Jeremy Corbyn followed where the Le Green Party led when it came to some of those social policies. And as a result, he did very well at that last election. I can't deny that. But our membership is still massively higher than it well, was in the run-up to 2015. It was, it was, hold on a second. It was 63,000 in 2015, and it is 39,000 now. Yes, so what I mean so is... In the, no, that fall. is a massive drop. But we had the Green surge running up to 2015. So what I'm right, saying okay. is if you would take a year before 2015, we were on about 12,000. So, okay, so you, up at about 40,000, we are still way above where okay. we were there. But can I just say on, on, on environment, because although, yes, Jeremy Corbyn has, has famously followed us when it comes to things like bringing rail back into public ownership and some of our social policies, where he hasn't is on the environment. And I just want to say a word uh, about this. Can, can, we, can I ask you about Sheffield, which is a Labour-controlled council, where they are demolishing almost all the old trees in the, in the, in the city. And that is causing a huge local story and a lot of local upset. It is a massive story. We're seeing 6,000 mature, beautiful trees being cut down for no better reason than that it's cheaper to do so under the PFI contract that the Labour councillors have, have uh, 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 set up. And it's our councillor, the Green councillor, Alison but, Teal, who has okay. been taking peaceful direct action to protect those trees. The way that her Labour colleagues responded to that was to try to get her having a custodial sentence when she was tried. Now, thankfully, mm. she was acquitted. But the idea that okay. Labour councillors are trying to persecute someone who has the courage to protect these trees from, a, from a, an entirely commercially driven set of uh, proposals to, to cut them down, and they are being cut down, I think really shows their true colours, I'm afraid. Let me suggest that you have one other little nightmare going on, which is that a Conservative Environment Secretary, Michael Gove, when it comes to plastics and, and, and uh, animal welfare and cruelty to animals and lots of other issues, lots of issues around health, uh, the health of the, the countryside and hedgerows, is actually saying things which are attracting the green vote. George Monbiot, who is about as near as you get to a, a green guru in the mainstream media, has said he can't believe it. Day after day, week after week, a Conservative Environment Secretary is saying the kind of things he's always wanted an Environment Secretary to say. Well, I think the, go, crucial, Michael Gove, you can the, say. the crucial word that you've repeated several times is Gove is saying lots of things. And Gove is certainly saying lots of things. And to that extent, that's welcome. He's learnt some of the language. But if you look at the detail, look at that 25-year environment plan. The top line of that was basically saying, we will try to get rid of single-use plastics by 2042, by a quarter of a century's time. Right. Um, so there are no real targets. There's no real sense that this has changed from the Michael mm. Gove, who not long ago was trying to take climate out of the curriculum. We need to see far more ambitious action on the environment, because that was the point I was hoping to talk about, which was that we are facing a sixth 
mass extinction. We are overfishing, we are cutting down too many trees, the environmental crisis is getting worse. And that is why the Green Party is needed more than ever. Caroline Lucas, thank you very much thank for you. talking to us. I've been getting away with it all.